Good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Welcome to the Nestle 9 month 2021 sales webcast. I'm Luca Borlini, head of Nestle's investor relation. Today, I'm joined by our chief executive officer, Mark Schneider, and our chief financial officer, Francois Roger. Mark will begin with our key messages and discuss the full year 2021 guidance. Francois will follow with a review of the nine month 2021 sales figures. We will then open the lines for your questions. Before we begin, please take note of our disclaimer. And now I hand over to Mark. Thank you, Luca, and a warm welcome to our conference call participants today. As always, we appreciate your interest in our company. We are pleased to report another quarter of exceptionally strong organic sales growth. As you know, we also had a strong comparable quarter last year when we posted an organic sales growth rate of 4.9%. So it was no small feat to get to 6.5% in Q3 this year. As you can see from the slide, our year-to-date organic sales growth is 7.6%. As in previous quarters, growth was broad-based across most geographies and categories, which is reassuring. The only real exception was our infant nutrition business, which suffers from globally reduced birth rates in the context of the COVID pandemic and a strong sales decline in China. I can assure you that we're working hard to fix our issues in China and find new growth opportunities globally for this key category of Nestle. We completed the acquisition of core brands of the Bountiful company in line with our schedule and are very pleased with the company's performance and our progress with regards to integrating this business. Interest in personal health, in particular in boosting the immune system, continues to be high as we're entering the second Northern Hemisphere winter of the COVID pandemic. I would also like to comment on last week's announcement regarding Nestle's future organizational structure. Local relevance in everything we do and staying close to local consumers around the world has long been a hallmark of Nestle. We're now taking this approach to the next level and fully reflect the importance of our two largest global markets, North America and China, in our geographic zone structure. In doing so, we will sharpen the geographic focus of all five of our zones and increase agility in a fast-moving consumer environment. The new structure has broad support inside our company and with our executive leadership team. It will be effective January 1st, 2022. Under the business as a force for good section this quarter, we're focusing on our actions to promote regenerative agriculture. This initiative is a direct follow-on from our net zero carbon roadmap published last December. The roadmap made it clear that for a food and beverage company like ours, the key challenge on the road to net zero lies in our agricultural supply chain. This is where about two thirds of our greenhouse gas emissions lie, and so this deserves our full attention. The move towards regenerative agriculture requires patient effort on the ground around the world in order to find local solutions that work for a specific environment and agricultural product. In our approach to this, we are firmly committed to the notion of what we call a just transition. It will not be sufficient to just raise the environmental specifications of the commodities we buy. This will be unfair to many farmers who do not have the know-how or the resources to comply. We provide first-hand technical assistance and help to arrange financial support. While there are many benefits related to regenerative agriculture, the concept of restoring soil health stands out. Improved soil health stores more carbon in the ground, improves water retention and water management, and supports biodiversity. In this context, and ahead of COP26 in Glasgow next month, I would like to comment on the development of our greenhouse gas emissions. Reducing them is no longer just a future plan for us. It is a reality, and I'm proud to say that we have left peak carbon behind us. Since 2019, our greenhouse gas emissions are decreasing, 
even though Nestle keeps growing. We are on our client payoff down and fully on track for our first intermediate target, a 20% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2025. Before handing it over to Francois, I would like to comment on our updated guidance. We are now expecting organic sales growth for the full year in the range of 6% to 7%. This reflects the strong performance in the third quarter and our continued good prospects for the remainder of the year. We leave all other guidance aspects unchanged. It will be tempting for some to translate the higher sales growth expectations into higher expectations for our underlying trading operating profit margin. I would like to caution against that in the current cost inflation environment where input costs are rising faster than we can roll forward through pricing. As you know, we have consistently cautioned on this aspect as from our Q1 conference call in April. The situation has not improved. If anything, we're seeing further downsides compared to what we told you in the summer. With this, let me hand it over to Francois. Thank you, Mark, and good morning, good afternoon to all. Let me start with the highlight for the nine months of 2021. Organic growth was 7.6%, rig was strong at 6% with increased contribution from volume and solid mix. Pricing increased to 1.6%. Acquisitions net of divestitures reduced sales by 3.3%, largely related to the divestment of the Nestle Waters brand in North America, Yinlu peanut milk and canned rice porridge businesses in China, as well as the Erta charcuterie business. The negative impact on sales from foreign exchange moderated to 2%, turning positive in the third quarter. Total reported sales for the nine months were 63.3 billion Swiss francs, a 2.2% increase versus last year on a reported basis. Overall, the strong growth in the nine months was driven by three key factors. Continued momentum in retail sales with a steady recovery in out-of-home channels, increased pricing for a fourth consecutive quarter, reflecting input cost inflation, further market share gains across most categories. The latest available data showed that we were gaining our holding share in more than 60% of business sales. These slides illustrate the development of our sales by geography and includes both our zones as well as our globally managed businesses. Organic growth was strong in all geographies. Pricing improved particularly in the Americas and EMENA, while rig remained strong. The increase in pricing reflects our ability to offset input cost increases and currency appreciation, supported by the strengths of our brands, product differentiation, and leading market positions. Growth was balanced with strong contributions from developed and emerging markets. Organic growth in developed markets increased to 7.1%, reflecting positive contribution from all regions and a significant increase in pricing, particularly for North America. Growth in emerging markets was 8.3%, with strong contribution from Brazil, India, Russia, and Mexico. Let's now look at the breakdown of sales by channel. Organic growth for retail sales was 6.6%, with a mid-single-digit rate in the third quarter following a high base of comparison in 2020. Within retail, e-commerce saw sustained growth of 17.2%. E-commerce now accounts for 14.1% of total sales. Most categories saw strong momentum in e-commerce, particularly coffee, Purina Pet Care, and culinary. Sales growth in out-of-home channels reached 22.8%, helped by a low base of comparison last year and the further easing of movement restrictions in some geographies. The level of sales remained below 2019. We confirm that the impact from input cost inflation is expected to be around 4% of cost of goods sold for the full year 2021. However, one thing that we would draw your attention to is a rise in energy and freight cost. So, if anything, the situation has therefore slightly worsened versus July. We continue to proactively address these inflationary pressures and have steadily increased prices over the last four quarters with pricing accelerating to 2.1% in the third quarter. In the nine months, 
pricing reach 1.6%, a level that we have not seen for the last six years. We expect to progressively increase pricing in a responsible manner over the remainder of 2021 and 2022 with different trends by geography and category. Beyond pricing, we continue to strengthen the development of affordable offerings, particularly those that meet nutritional needs in emerging markets. These efforts help to soften the effect of inflation for those most impacted. In addition, we are using other, lever, other levers such as product mix, discipline cost management and the further rollout of strategic revenue management tools. We have also benefited from increased centralized procurement. Let's now look at the results of our five operating segments, beginning with Zone AMS, where we saw high single-digit growth with a high base of comparison in 2020. Sales were 24.6 billion Swiss francs, with organic growth at 8.4%, based on robust rig of 5.2%, and a further increase in pricing to 3.2%. Pricing was 5% in the third quarter. Growth was supported by continued innovation, strong momentum in e-commerce, and a further recovery in out-of-home channels. The zone also saw continued broad-based market share gains, led by coffee, pet food, and dairy. North America grew at a mid-single-digit rate in the context of significant supply chain constraints. The largest contributors to growth were Purina Pet Care and Nestle Professional. Growth in Purina Pet Care was driven by science-based premium brand Purina Proplan, Fancy Feast, and Purina One. Sales in frozen and chilled food grew at a mid-single-digit rate with strong sales development for staffers, lean cuisine, freshly and hot pockets, partially offset by a sales decrease in pizza following a high base of comparison in 2020. The beverages category, including Starbucks at-home products, Coffee Met and Nescafe posted mid-single-digit growth. Sales in water grew at a mid-single-digit rate with double-digit growth in the third quarter, driven by strong sales development for Essentia. Following increased consumer demand, Essentia introduced a large format of its ionized alkaline water. Latin America posted double-digit growth with broad-based contributions across geographies and most categories led by Mexico, Brazil, and Chile. By product categories, the largest contributor to growth was Purina Pet Care, with strong sales developments across all brands, markets, and channels. Sales in confectionery, coffee, and Nestle Professional all grew at a strong double-digit rate. Infant nutrition saw mid-single-digit growth, accelerating to a high single-digit rate in the third quarter, based on robust demand for new premium and functional products. Shifting to Zone MNA, sales were 15.5 billion Swiss francs. Organic growth was 7.2% based on strong rig, supported by both volume and mix. Pricing increased to 0.8%, with Western Europe turning positive in the third quarter. Growth was driven by successful innovation and continued strong momentum in e-commerce and specialist channels. The zone continued to see broad-based market share gains, particularly for pet food, coffee, plant-based products, and infant nutrition. Each market posted positive growth with strong sales development in Russia, Turkey, the United Kingdom, and Italy. The key growth drivers continued to be Purina Pet Care and Coffee, supported by continued innovation across all brands. In Pet Care, new business models including Tells.com and Lily's Kitchen also strong double-digit growth. Nestle Professional reported double-digit growth. Sales in water grew at a mid-single-digit rate, despite unfavorable weather conditions in Central Europe in the third quarter. Sales in confectionery grew at a mid-single-digit rate, with double-digit growth for premium brands, such as Les Recettes de l'Atelier. Culinary saw low single-digit growth. Strong demand for Garden Gourmet and Mindful Chef was partially offset by slightly negative growth in cooking aids and pizza following elevated demand in 2020. Nestle also introduced Mesist, a new Middle Eastern cuisine food brand. Infant nutrition posted slightly negative growth due to lower birth rate in the context of the pandemic, but saw high single-digit growth in the third quarter with continued market share gains. 
Moving next to zone AOA, with sales of 15.2 billion Swiss francs. Organic growth was 4.1%, reflecting a difficult environment still impacted by regional lockdowns. Growth turned slightly negative in the third quarter, following a sales decline in infant nutrition in China on a high base of comparison in 2020. Most categories gained market share, led by coffee, culinary, and pet food. China posted low single-digit growth, excluding infant nutrition. China saw double-digit growth driven by Nestle Professional, coffee, culinary, dairy, and Purina. Infant nutrition posted a sales decline impacted by challenging market conditions. Turnaround initiatives continue to progress with further actions being implemented, including a review of our portfolio and distribution strategy. Outside of China infant nutrition, the ZOD reported high single-digit growth. South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Japan and Korea also strong sales developments. Southeast Asia continued to be impacted by movement restrictions and regional lockdowns. By product category, the key growth drivers were culinary, coffee and Nestle professional. Sales in confectionery and ice cream grew at a high single-digit rate. Dairy reported mid-single-digit growth, led by strong demands for fortified milks. Infant nutrition saw a sales decline with growth turning positive outside of China in the third quarter, supported by strong cell development in South Asia and Africa. Next is Nespresso, which saw sales of 4.7 billion Swiss francs. Organic growth reached 11%, based on strong rig of 10.4% and pricing of 0.6%. Growth was mid-single digit in the third quarter due to a high base of comparison in 2020. The virtual system continued to drive growth, with the original system also contributing positively. Increased consumer adoption and innovation supported growth. Nespresso expanded coffee offerings across the virtual system, including Peru Organic. Nespresso also added Novecento and Milenio to the Italian heritage range for the original system. Chiara Ferragni's summer collection and social media campaign resonated strongly with consumers. By channel, boutiques and out-of-home channels saw a further recovery with continued positive sales development in e-commerce. By geography, the Americas and AOA all grew at a double-digit rate. Emena saw high single-digit growth. Overall, Nespresso gained market share with contribution from most markets. Finishing with Nestle Health Science, which reported sales of 3.2 billion Swiss francs. The business grew at a double digit rate, building on a strong sales development in 2020. Vitamin, minerals and supplements that support health and the immune system continue to see strong demands with broad based market share gains across channels and markets. Growth was supported by e commerce momentum, new product launches, geographic expansion and strong supply chain execution. Consumer care posted double-digit growth with strong contribution from vital proteins, garden of life, persona, and pure encapsulations. Healthy aging products such as Boost, Meritain, and Nutren also saw robust growth. The newly acquired core brands of the Bountiful Company, in particular Nature Bounties and Solga, posted strong double-digit growth. Noon functional hydration products also grew at a strong double-digit rate. Medical nutrition saw mid-single-digit growth with robust demand for Complete, a comprehensive nutritional tube feeding formula, and pediatric care products such as Altera, Alfare, and Alfamino. By geography, the Americas, Emena, and EOE all posted double-digit growth. Looking now at product categories, we saw strong growth in all segments, with the exception of infant nutrition. Most categories saw market share gains, with particular strengths in coffee, pet food, and Nestle Health Science. Within powdered and liquid beverages, coffee grew by more than 10%, supported by Nescafe, Nespresso, and Starbucks products. Growth was supported by new product launches across all brands, Sales of Starbucks products grew by 15.5% to reach 2.2 billion Swiss francs across 79 markets. 
cocoa and malt beverages grew at mid-single-digit rate with particular strains for ready-to-drink formats. Pet care continued to see very strong growth globally. Most segments and geographies grew at a double-digit rate with market share gains. Purina's performance was driven by continued strong demand for premium products, supported by successful innovation and momentum across all channels. Nutrition and health science grew at 0.8%. Organic growth in infant nutrition was minus 5.2%, reflecting a sales decrease in China and a slowdown in birth rate across geographies in the context of the pandemic. Outside of China, growth was positive in the third quarter and we continue to gain market share, led by human milk oligosaccharides and functional formula products. We have already discussed Nestle Health Science. Growth was 7.5% for prepared dishes and cooking aid. Ambient culinary grew at a high single-digit rate, supported by Maggi. Chilled culinary reported double-digit growth fueled by the recently acquired D2C businesses Freshly and Mindful Chef. Frozen saw mid-single-digit growth. Vegetarian and plant-based food products continue to deliver double-digit growth led by Garden Gourmet. In early October, we expanded the Garden Gourmet range with the launches of Veggie, a plant-based alternative to eggs, and Vrimp, a plant-based seafood offering. Milk products and ice cream grew at 6.4%. The key growth drivers were fortified milks, coffee creamers, and ice cream. Waters grew 4.3%, held by a recovery in out-of-home channels and with strong contribution from North America and emerging markets in the third quarter. Growth in confectionery reached 9.5%, reflecting a further recovery in impulse and gifting products. Let me now hand over to Luca for the Q&A. Thank you, Francois. And with that, we move uh, to the Q&A session. We open the lines uh, for questions from financial analysts. Uh, please note uh, to limit yourself to no more than two questions. The first question is from Guillaume Delmas at UBS. Please go ahead, Guillaume. Uh, thank you, Luca. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Marc uh, and Francois. Um, my first question is on your margin guidance uh, of around 17.5%. Because back in July, um, you were indicating that this guidance was uh, cautious and conservative. Today, you are reiterating this guidance, but in light of the last three months development in commodity packaging transportation costs, do you still view this guidance as being uh, conservative? Um, and then my second question is on um, pricing. So we clearly saw a sequential step up in the third quarter, but could you shed more light on the percentage of your portfolio where you took some pricing at the end of Q3? And where do you expect to be uh, by the end of this year? And also, if I can add on the, my pricing question, I mean, despite your very strong rig performance uh, in Q3, can I ask if you've, if you've seen some instances where pricing had a knock-on impact on your volume? Thank you. Guillaume, this is Mark. Uh, thanks for your questions. I'll take a first uh, crack at them and then hand over to Francois. And um, I guess on the margin guidance, I mean, it, as you know, um, being conservative and cautious is one of our hallmarks, so that is not changing. Uh, what you're seeing here following um, the presentation from Francois and mine, I mean, there are some pluses and minuses. Uh, so clearly uh, the input cost situation has slightly worsened from the summer. But then, of course, if you are uh, aiming to post an organic sales growth rate that is um, basically a full percentage point higher than guided in the summer, uh, that also has some operating uh, efficiencies uh, stemming from it. So there's puts and takes, and uh, by and large, uh, we still feel comfortable uh, with that uh, guidance range of around 17.5%. Uh, Francois speaking. Good afternoon, uh, Guillaume. On the uh, question on pricing, it's difficult to say what is the percentage of our products to which we apply pricing. You can see that pricing has been increasing sequentially, and you can expect, by the way, since you were asking about uh, the outlook in terms of pricing without providing guidance, but you can expect that pricing will ramp up further in Q4 and next year as well, because we do expect to have a higher uh, input cost inflation uh, next year in 2022. 
it's difficult to look at it as a percentage of our sales. It's more related to the specific categories that have been hit by input cost inflation. If you look at it this year in 2021, it's much more about, uh, for example, dairy or uh, pet care. So this is where we really started to uh, put through some pricing. As far as uh, coffee is concerned, we did less so far, but we can expect that we will have more pricing on coffee next year because this is really when we will start uh, feeling the, uh, the pressure on input cost inflation by category. As far as uh, volume and elasticity, you can see that still we have a strong rig, which is largely uh, led by volume as well, as so we have a positive contribution from mix. So volume remains very positive and very attractive. Part of it is linked to, to some tailwind that we had in the context of the, of the pandemic with a higher consumption at home. So we see volume slowing, the volume growth slowing down a little bit as we progress over time, but remaining still very attractive. Um, is it linked to pricing? There is no evidence of it. We believe that it is more linked to the, uh, ex uh, to the exit of the pandemic to a large extent and the fact that uh, we have a little bit maybe less consumption at home and more consumption mm -hmm. out of home, but there is no direct link for the time being with pricing. Next question is from uh, Warren Ackerman at uh, Barclays. Please go ahead, Warren. Uh, hi, everybody. So Warren here at Barclays. Um, two questions from me as well. The first one is on China infant formula. I think I heard you rightly saying you're doing a full review of the portfolio and distribution strategy. I think maybe, Mark, would, could you maybe elaborate a little bit on the kind of options you're looking at in China? It seems to me to be one of the few remaining underperforming parts of the portfolio. Um, and it was underperforming even before COVID. Um, and does zone, moving to zone China, does that help on the agility to try and sort of fix the Luma and S26 brands? I was just interested to know um, what kind of scope you're looking at in terms of that kind of review. Um, and the second one is just following on from the whole pricing margin commodity uh, question. Francois, are you able to give us an early feel for what the Cox inflation might look like for 2022, given some of the hedging rolling off? I know you said 4% confirmed for 2021. Uh, how much higher do you expect it to be for 2022? And then maybe could you help us with some of the building blocks for the 2022? I know it's perhaps a little bit early and there's lots of moving parts, but for example, you've said that you'll be spending a billion Swiss francs on climate change investments. Is that still a number that is valid? Or you know, what other offsets do you have going into next year, given COGS inflation is higher and presumably climate costs are also higher? Thank you. Thanks, Warren. Uh, so let me start on China. And before turning specifically to nutrition, uh, let me comment quickly on uh, the zone structure. Uh, as you know, Crater China will be uh, the smallest of the five zones, and the fact that we elevated it to a zone, you should see that as a sign of complete commitment and also future optimism when it comes to the potential of that market. And um, we are all in on China, and we will do what it takes to win there over time. We recognize that in quite a few categories, uh, we did have uh, some performance issue over the past uh, decade or so, we are absolutely focused on fixing those and succeeding in that market because it has such a little promise uh, for the future. And in that context, you're right, uh, nutrition is a standout. Uh, we made no pretenses that uh, nutrition in China was underperforming before COVID. Uh, so we're not blaming it on COVID. Uh, COVID has made it worse, uh, not only in China, but also elsewhere. But uh, we need to dig deeper here and we need to find a winning formula for our nutrition business in China. As we do that, um, I mean, we hinted at some of the levers we have in the past, like a clearer and more articulated uh, channel strategy, top-notch innovation, and then also uh, a stronger local offering and also increased cross-border um, e-commerce, as an example. When it comes to some of the details we're looking at now, but I'm also asking for your understanding that I wouldn't want to go too deep into um, you know, any future steps that might involve competitive signaling. I think for our shareholders, it's in our best interest here that uh, we basically um, you know, publish those moves as and when they happen. But what I want to reassure you about is uh, we will stay totally committed to this business in China. What we're doing is not a retrenchment. Uh, we're not pulling out of there. Uh, we believe that winning there is going to be essential. This is the largest and most demanding infant formula market in the world. And um, 
uh, we are committed to being a very competitive player in that market. Warren, uh, Francois speaking. Good afternoon. On the um, input cost inflation for 2022, I'm afraid I can't give you a figure now. The main reason is that we see still a lot of volatility. So, I mean, it's really moving uh, almost by the day. Uh, what we know, though, is that it will be higher than in 2021. But I would say more than the amount, what matters is the way we can mitigate it and the way we can offset it. Uh, the main, uh, given the impact, uh, the, main imp the main way to uh, offset and mitigate input cost inflation will be pricing, but there are other ways as well, like uh, strategic revenue management, like uh, increasing our uh, efficiency program and so forth, and we have covered, I think, uh, part of it. But So clearly, uh, no... Uh, no full visibility at this stage, and we are still two and a half months before the beginning of the year. What we see, though, just to give you a little bit more color, as I mentioned earlier, we see that in some areas like coffee and aluminium, for example, for packaging, we see a clear increase coming in for next year. Uh, just uh, since you were touching on the climate issue, we did make a commitment. Indeed, if we, la if we uh, include uh, uh, ESG at large and sustainability at large, it's about a billion a year over the last uh, next five years, between 21 and 25. Uh, this is something that we want to ring fence anyway. This is not because we see commodity input cost uh, inflation in commodities, packaging, transportation, and so forth, that we are going to start saving on uh, the climate commitment and climate investment that we want to do. So to, uh, I would say in the same way as back into 2016 when we started to uh, look at efficiency program, we ring fence marketing and R&D, and I think it was very wise to do it. We can add to the list to a very large extent uh, climate and ESG, uh, we have made commitments. We need to get there. That being said, we need to be efficient in managing those investments as well. This is very much what we are on the top of. Warren, uh, let me add one aspect here on a very high level, and that is um, I want to make it clear our industry in general is not an industry that is uh, in normal times pinched uh, by inflation. Uh, so when you are in a regular inflationary rhythm, if you roughly know what is going to be happening next, uh, this industry can adjust and uh, can basically maintain its financial performance. It was specifically the turning point that came out of the flu of this year and I think took the entire industry by surprise that led to some of the compression that we described in the summer. But once, um, and I want to make that point just in case, you know, this inflationary cycle extends beyond 22 on a longer term basis. Once we know what to expect, I think we can uh, pretty much adjust to that and in our pricing behavior and some of the other levers we have, uh, make the best of it. It was specifically the turning point that created a challenge for this year. Okay. Next question is from uh, Celine Panuti at JP Morgan. Please go ahead, uh, Celine. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, Mark. Um, François Xavier and Luca. Uh, my uh, first question is on pricing. Um, I should like I just talked about, but um, pricing was quite low in zone AOA and even in Europe. I think you said it turned positive in Western Europe. Um, I was wondering why such a, a slow um, level, especially in emerging markets in AOA, um, and how confident are you about the acceleration in these regions? Um, my second question, and maybe uh, coming back on the uh, guide on margin for this year, uh, you said that the plug inflation is around 4%. It has not really changed. Can you say uh, what is the impact that you see from energy and distribution costs? Um, and, you know, am I right in understanding that you are confident about this around 17.5%, but maybe a notch below that uh, a specific number? Thank you. Celine, uh, let me start off on the pricing and then hand it to uh, Francois. So AOA is really, for the most part, the consequence of a number of one-off steps that we've taken uh, in China and nutrition there specifically. And uh, so this is what uh, tracked down uh, the zone. The rest of the performance there is actually uh, quite uh, satisfactory to us. And then IMINA is, uh, to most part, um, the consequence of our contractual relationship to retailers in Europe where when it comes to uh, contract dates where you can adjust pricing, uh, you don't have the same flexibility as in some other parts of the world. So going forward, of course, uh, we will have to take pricing there as well. Uh, we've taken some already, uh, but uh, it doesn't go as fast as it goes in some other geographies. Good afternoon, Celine, Francois speaking. On the... Uh Input cost inflation and uh, pricing, indeed, we confirm the value of around 4% of cost of goods equivalent uh, for 2021. 
Uh, what we see is that since we talked to you in July, this, is this has been relatively stable as far as commodities and packaging uh, is concerned. The main reason, especially as far as the commodities is concerned, is that we had some edging in pla place as well as some uh, forward buying, so this is the reason why it didn't move much. But as we said, the uh, deterioration that we saw is clearly on energy and transportation costs, and to a lesser extent a little bit in salaries and social costs as well, but mainly on uh, energy and uh, transportation, which hits our PNL directly, which is the reason why we are just saying even if we confirm the 4% of cost of goods, we have seen some deterioration since July. I can't quantify it. Once again, I mean, the year is not over either, so we still see some volatility, and these items are hitting the PNL straight away. Next question is from uh, Bruno Montaigne at Bernstein. Uh, please go ahead, uh, Bruno. Hi. <coughs> Good afternoon. The first question is on your uh, forward-looking margin guidance. You normally talk about moderate margin improvement in, in coming years. But given that next year you should have the benefit of bountiful uh, costs that are falling out, those temporary commodity costs that you say is a temporary problem, so next year should come back when you've been updating the pricing, am I right to think that you're still thinking next year's should be a bit more than a very small moderate margin improvement. And the second question is related to your sales uh, growth guidance, typically mid-single digit. Now, this year was an exceptionally good year, and I'm trying to gauge to what extent there's some one-offs in there. So you still feel that the full mid-single digit, 4 to 6% is achievable next year, despite the amazingly strong year this year, or should be already factored in to some sort of tough, tough comps discussions next year. Thank you. Thanks, Bruno. And um, let me start off, and maybe Francois can also build on a few points. So when it comes to the uh, midterm margin improvement, you will see that the language we use in our guidance is uh, uh, very much unchanged from uh, previous quarters and uh, what we issued at the beginning of the year. So this is our standard ambition uh, that we're aiming for. Um, I understand your optimism. I love your optimism, but it's also important not to get uh, too greedy here um, because – um, I think that turning point that I described um, is um, probably also extending into at least the first half of next year. I mean, it really only started uh, this spring and summer, and uh, I think a year of an adjustment here is probably a reasonable estimate. And then from there, we have to see uh, where pricing develops. So, um, again, uh, good momentum, uh, hard work on the margin, but... Um, it's important that we're not racing here to a 2022 guidance at a moment when we haven't even finished uh, 21 yet. Um, on the 4 to 6 percent or mid-single digit as we described it, I think in a day and age of volatility where we live, it's um, a good band. It's good to have that wider band compared to the old 5 to 6 percent of the uh, Nestle model. Um, I think when it comes to next year, uh, we're looking at the year with optimism because we still see continued good volume, we see continued good mix, and of course, as we just discussed, uh, there will be more activity on pricing. And so um, that year-over-year -year, um, fear that you have, I'm probably a bit more on the optimistic side when it comes to that. Thank you. Next question is from uh, Patrick Schwendiman at Zurich Cantonal Bank. Please go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, thank you, Luca. Hi, Mark. Hi, Francois. Congrats for the outstanding results. Both the out-of-home channel and the retail channel have been very strong in the third quarter. Typically, you would expect some slowdown in the retail channel when your out-of-home is recovering. Was, was there some inventory build-up here before the further price increase in the retail and out-of-home channel, or do you expect a similar growth pattern in, in, the, in the near future? That's my first question. And second question, would you say it would be a fair assumption to say that in 22 the price contribution to the organic growth will be higher than the RIC contribution? Thank you. Patrick, let me uh, start on the first one and then hand it to Francois for the second one. Um, so the out-of-home recovery uh, is reassuring, uh, but you're right. It's not a push-pull relationship that whatever we gain there is then taken away from the retail side of the house. Um, I think in out-of-home we're still not back to the levels from before the crisis, so I think there's still some upward room for improvement here. And as you know, in earlier calls we had pointed to uh, the year 22 as a point in time when hopefully 
we're reaching 2019 levels again. And this is, of course, provided that we see no surprises uh, from the pandemic. But I think uh, we have reached a situation where people are returning back to traveling for business or vacation. And yet, at the same time, there's also more working from home and um, uh, more in-home consumption, coffee being a good example. Uh, people have adopted more pets, and hence, as you know, there was a sort of a one-time step up here and now grow from a higher base when it comes to um, uh, pet food um, for dogs and cats. So I feel that, um, you know, th th there is an underlying positive uh, that happened uh, to, the, um, to the overall picture and the relationship between out-of-home and retail. You asked about people maybe buying ahead of inflation and stockpiling. Uh, we have seen no evidence of that. And I think when you look at the pricing action here, it is still, you know, a reasonably moderate, moderate pricing action. And so nothing that, you know, would lead now people to fill up their pantries, fill up the basement to be guarded for the future. Patrick, uh, Francois Thank speaking. Uh, just to, to answer your question on the pricing contribution next year, yes, indeed, it is a fair assumption to uh, assume that pricing will have a stronger um, impact on our total organic growth. You see it already. We are at 1.6 uh, year to date in uh, nine months, but we were already at 2.1% in Q3. Do expect further uh, higher pricing in Q4 and again next year. So indeed, it will, uh, it will come certainly to a higher level next year. That being said, it's important to understand as well that there is a certain likelihood that our volume growth will slow down while remaining positive and probably higher than what it was uh, pre-pandemic. So we are very optimistic still on, uh, on volume, and the volume growth slowdown is not necessarily linked to pricing. We believe that it is much more linked to the fact that we are exiting the pandemic step by step, and as a consequence of that, we are comparing against a high level of cons precisely for what we just discussed, which is a higher level of at-home consumption, and this is probably what is going to uh, slow down our volume growth more than the pricing. Perhaps. Yes. Next question is from uh, John Cox at Kepler. Uh, hello, John. Yeah, hi, guys. Uh, yeah, congrats from my side as well. A great print um, for Q3 and probably reflects the amount of work you guys have been doing uh, on the business over the last couple of years as much as you know, COVID and the rest of it. Um, a couple of questions from my side. Just to, just to clarify what you're saying there um, in terms of volume growth, you expect to be higher than, say, the 3% you've seen uh, pre-pandemic, uh, and then in addition, you expect the, the pricing to be, you know, you're talking about over 2 maybe 3%. It's quite easy then to start adding up to 5 or 6% organic sales growth next year. I'm, I'm not sure if you, you meant to do that. Second question, just on coffee. Um, looking at Nespresso, it looks like there was a slowdown in Q3, and then you talk about very strong growth, you know, elsewhere in the coffee portfolio, but when I look at the prepared dishes, Again, it looks like there was a uh, sorry the um, uh, the drinks powder drinks business. It looks like there was a slowdown in Q3. Can you just tell us what's happening in Q3? Is it just more like phasing, or you know, I know the comps were pretty tricky as well Q3 a year ago, but it seems there's actually a, a slowdown in coffee during the third quarter. Thank you, John. Uh, let me take the, the first question. On, uh, on the volume, just to avoid any misunderstanding, we didn't give any figure of 3%. What, uh, when I was referring to the pre-pandemic uh, level, we were growing in 2018-19 at around 1% to 1.5% by volume. So uh, we expect to be at that level or at a higher level going forward, but uh, currently we are running at a significantly higher rate, once again, mainly as uh, benefiting from a tailwind from uh, COVID and the at-home consumption. So we expect some... Uh, volume uh, growth slowed down, but uh, back to the, uh, the level that we had pre-pandemic or at a higher level. On the coffee uh, slowdown in Q3, you said it is largely linked to high comps, and we mentioned it, for example, for Nespresso. Nespresso is still in Q3 at mid-single-digit growth, which is attractive, which is where we were pre at the pre-pandemic level, but let's not forget that this comes on the top of a double-digit growth last year in Q3. And to a large extent, this applies as well to the other brand that we have, like uh, Nescafe. doesn't apply to Starbucks, but which is a different, uh, different story because it's uh, relatively recent. But as you know, uh, for example, since the beginning of the year, we have been growing north of 15% as far as Starbucks is concerned. Next question is from uh, David Hayes at uh, Société Générale. Hello, David. Please go ahead. Thanks, Luca. Good afternoon also. Um, just a couple of questions, just digging back into... 
to the, the China dynamic. Obviously, as you talked about, double-digit growth for China the first half, down to low single digit for the nine months would suggest that China overall was down about 10%, I guess, in the third quarter. So I guess that the first part of the question is, is that correct in terms of the maths? Um, and then if it is down that kind of quantum, given that the rest of the business sounds pretty good, apart from IMF, infant formula, it is infant formula down around 20% or so in the quarter? And then related, if that's true, uh, the two questions are, was, was that because of some resetting of the portfolio from a a volume perspective, some destocking that you often get in China. And I guess, picking up on a comment you made earlier, Mark, I think you said there was a pricing reduction in input formula that then contributed to the AOA. So is that a strategic move that you took, that you lowered the price point in China as part of the, the addressing the, uh, the strategic direction of that, that business? Thanks so much. Uh, David, uh, let me take the question. So, indeed, uh, we have seen a slowdown in China. Once again, it is absolutely linked to... Uh, the negative performance that we saw on uh, infant nutrition, and we touched on it, it affected uh, the pricing, which we saw even uh, for the emerging market uh, pricing dynamics. This is essentially linked in Q3 to one-offs. And uh, so we don't expect that it will happen again in, uh, in Q4. And this is not at all linked to the fact that we reduce pricing, but this is linked to one-off, which are uh, Zelfem related to the uh, review that we are doing of our product portfolio and our distribution strategy as well. So, but once again, it will not happen in Q4 and not linked to uh, price decreases. Next question is from John Ennis at Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead, John. Yeah, hello, everyone, and thanks for taking my question. I'll, I'll stick to one, and, and it's on your investment plans in an inflationary environment. So during historic inflation cycles, I guess when margins came under pressure in 2011, for instance, marketing was used as a partial offset to support EBIT margins by Nestle and then likewise reinvested when the, the, the cycle turned deflationary. So I guess my question is, are you planning on doing something similar during this cycle or is there a bigger commitment to hold or even increase investments and any update on, on how those are trending would be, would be helpful? Thank you. John, I guess my um, high-level answer to that would be uh, we don't even know yet whether it's going to be a longer-term inflation cycle. As you know, some of our projects takes, uh, take years uh, to put into the ground when it comes to you know, a new greenfield facility or so forth. And um, so at this point, especially given the elevated demand levels we've seen in so many categories um, for the past few years, getting us closer to capacity limits, it's more about assuring – capacity uh, to be able to supply, to be able to cater to all that growth and making sure that we can, you know, our ability to deliver is, um, is, is not diminished. So at this point, uh, it's not so much about financial fine-tuning. It's really in quite a few categories we've been positively surprised by the strength of demand, by the strength of our success in the market. And so it's about really making sure that we have enough headroom uh, that under all circumstances we can satisfy our retail partners and our consumers. Does that hold true for Mark? Uh, John, I think that your question was also about marketing, so maybe let me complement what Mark said. It is true that in the past we may have had deviations in an adjustment at the end of the year in marketing investment uh, according to the commodity cycle. We don't have much of it now because, as you know, over the last couple of years, we consolidated our procurement activities largely above market, so which means that we have a much, much better visibility going forward on what's going to happen. So as a consequence of that, we are in a better position to anticipate uh, the impact of uh, commodities on our P&L for the, uh, the current year and even for the next year to a large extent, which means that we have far, far less adjustments, if any, uh, today in our marketing investment, which uh, where marketing has to be driven by innovation, it has to be driven by marketing needs, not as a variable for adjustment for procurement. So we don't do much of that now. Next question is from Tom Sykes at Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead, uh, Tom. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, just firstly, a uh, couple of questions on promotions. I just wondered if you could say something on the changes in the level of promotion costs, either sequentially or year-on-year year relative to sales. It does look like in some of the scanner data there's a reversal of the year-on-year year increases you saw in Q2 as we went through Q3 and the degree interested in the degree to which that may have helped organic growth. 
And also, can I just check from an accounting point of view that that does sit within pricing and not within rig, please? And then just on the coffee business, could you please just remind us how much of coffee is out of home, excluding the boutiques, um, and the degree to which the out of home footprint um, has expanded, maybe due to investment that you've put in through the pandemic? I mean, what the, the outlook for out of home coffee growth is. I know you mentioned it a bit before, but if you could expand on that, that would be great. Thanks. Tom, Francois speaking, so I will take the first part of the question on the promotional cost. The year uh, 2021, especially when comparing to 2020, is a little bit uh, difficult to uh, review by quarter because we had a lot of volatility. It happened that last year in Q2 we had to uh, hold and freeze some promotional activities during the peak of the pandemic because we could not activate in-store promotional activities. So as a consequence, we caught up to a large extent because we like investing in promotion and marketing. But we caught up in the later part of the year, uh, last year in 2020. So by difference and by comparison, obviously this is creating some ups and downs this year. Um, we, uh, as once again, we like investing in marketing and, uh, and promotional activities, which is the reason why this is traditionally not something that we want to cut. On uh, what you were mentioning, the trade spent uh, from an accounting point, uh, price, the promotional activities, uh, some promotional activities are recorded uh, above um, net net sales, which means in trade spend, which means that you don't necessarily see them, and some of them, depending on their nature, are recorded in uh, SGNA. So the, once again, it depends on their nature. Uh, maybe on coffee, I assume your question was more related to Nespresso. Historically, before the pandemic, we had about 50% of the sales uh, which were through our boutiques and 50% through our e-commerce platform. Uh, as you can understand, during the pandemic, it was uh, even at some time uh, probably closer to 90% through our e-commerce platform and 10% through the boutique. Now I think it's probably back to maybe 60% uh, through our e-commerce platform and 40% through the boutique. So we have really seen the boutiques coming back. Boutiques are important as well because this is very much about consumer experience as well. So we do value these uh, outlets and they complement each other. Tom, if you are, we're asking also about out of form, uh, you know that out of form is around 10, 15% of sales are based on, uh, uh, of coffee sales are based on out of form activities. Next question and the last one is from Andreas von Arx at Bader. Please go ahead, Andreas. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, first question, given the input cost environment and your commitment to deliver a, a moderate margin improvement in 2022, I was wondering if you could comment on the restructuring spending you anticipate. I mean, can that margin improvement be achieved with a civil, similar level of restructuring spending, or shall, shall we expect here a step up in restructuring spending next year? And then the second question is on an interview you gave in a Swiss newspaper recently on the healthy uh, food uh, confectionery, and I assume um, sugar-based uh, drinks will be a part of your portfolio going forward. Uh, you say uh, you, this is a more impulse-driven product. I was wondering what would make you change that view, especially since in the same interview, you provide a picture of trend-setting young generations that seem to avoid exactly the same categories, and that trend-setting should be what we could see in the future, i.e. there would be much less demand for these high-sugar products. How does this go together? Thank you very much. Thanks, Andreas. Um, we're trying to be helpful regarding the first part of the question, but uh, we're not there yet when it comes to uh, 22 guidance. So at this point, it's all eyes on landing 21 in a highly volatile environment, as uh, Francois pointed out. Um, so in, in that context, also wanted to clarify, um, there is no guidance or commitment uh, for 2022 now to increase margins. We don't even know yet what the margin for 21 is going to be. Um, there is a midterm ambition um, that we have reiterated in our guidance text today. Um, that applies uh, to future years. So just wanted to be clear here that we're not, uh, our statements are not being misconstrued. And obviously restructuring is one of several levers uh, that we can use um, in order to increase operating efficiency. And um, uh, where exactly that mix is going to be, uh, we'll give you an update then uh, as we uh, report our full year 
uh, 21 and also provide the 22 guidance uh, in February. Regarding the uh, recent interview um, with uh, the uh, Swiss um, um, uh, newspaper you highlighted, um, so I just wanted to be clear, uh, when it comes to categories that are more uh, enjoyment related and um, uh, that uh, are not per se health driven, so confectionery is a good example, we are committed to that as well, and that's no change from the past. And um, the point I was trying to make there, rather than, of course, we try to offer uh, best-in-class nutritionals there too, but rather than trying to make these foods into the next health food, I think it's more important to switch to a different dimension, and that is um, guidelines for responsible consumption. So that could be portion size, that could be uh, perfect um, transparency on the ingredients, uh, including sugar content, and also, of course, very strict rules when it comes to uh, marketing to children. So uh, generally, when it comes to uh, these products, um, they are part of a uh, complete um, uh, diet that people keep. I mean, even the younger generation is not only about uh, health. I think enjoyment also uh, is um, uh, registering very high on the agenda. But um, the, uh, the ambition changes a little bit from just offering health alone to offering enjoyment in a, con in a, in a, in a responsible framework, if you will. And um, then separately, you're right, in that interview, I mentioned something that I mentioned on previous speeches as well. Um, youth never goes out of fashion. So as you spend time in university towns around the world, you basically see what the next generation uh, is very interested in. And, um, you know, getting inspired by that, to me, is no contradiction uh, to uh, offering products that are more enjoyment related. So the next generation will be just as much about enjoyment as the previous one. Obviously, preferences shift, uh, but um, um, I think for us as a food and beverage company, nutrition is one important dimension, but enjoyment is another one that we, we're, we're, not, we're not stepping away from. Thank you. With no further questions, we come to an end of our session today. I leave it to Mark to, uh, to say hello to everyone. Yeah, thanks a lot. Appreciate uh, your staying with us here. And um, then, uh, again, um, highly volatile environment and uh, looking forward to reporting you the full year 21 when we talk to each other in 22. Thanks.